Good morning. Our scripture reading for this morning is from the end of Matthew 7 to the beginning of Matthew 8. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. This is the word of the Lord. So today we are concluding, we are wrapping up our 10-month journey with Jesus through the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 and 6 and 7, perhaps his most famous public address, uh, perhaps the portion of scripture that has been uh, meditated on, taught on, preached on the most for the last 2,000 years. Uh, if you want to hear any of these uh, recordings uh, over the last 10 months, you can find all of them on our website, deeprunchurch.org. So, so concluding the Sermon on the Mount, John Calvin said that the Sermon on the Mount is a brief summary of the doctrines of Christ in which he spoke to his disciples about true happiness. Winston Churchill said, the Sermon on the Mount is the last word in Christian ethics. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, the Sermon on the Mount is the direct road to blessing. Martin Luther King Jr. said that it was the Sermon on the Mount, it was Jesus of Nazareth, that stirred the Negroes of Montgomery, Alabama to protest with the creative weapon of love. It was Sinclair Ferguson who wrote that the Sermon on the Mount is the manifesto of Jesus, his public, decla his public declaration of his policy in the kingdom of God. And most recently, Jonathan Pennington wrote that the Sermon on the Mount is Christianity's answer to the greatest metaphysical question that humanity has always faced, how can we experience true human flourishing? So together we have climbed up the mountain with Jesus and we have descended down the mountain with Jesus. He taught us about the Beatitudes, those beautiful, blessed statements about his vision for his disciples and for his kingdom. He taught us about this greater righteousness or this righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, this greater righteousness that someone needs to possess in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus has shown us, uh, Jesus showed us how this greater righteousness relates to the law of God. How this greater righteousness relates to a person's own personal religion. How this greater righteousness relates to a person's relationship to the world, to its people, to its systems and ways of life. And Jesus finally taught us about the two ways. He warned us three times that there are only two ways in life. Uh, there is the way to life and the way to destruction and that it has to do with whether or not we listen and obey all that he has said. And Matthew tells us that just as the crowds had followed Jesus up the mountain, uh, Jesus also is followed by disciples, by the crowds away from the mountain. The crowds followed him to the mountain, and now the crowds are following him away from the mountain. But, also recently said, uh, Jen Wilkin suggests in her study on the Sermon on the Mount that when Jesus came down from the mountain and the crowds followed him, she said, the scribes and the Pharisees left angry and the disciples left altered. But some people walked away angry, but some people walked away altered. The same words by the same teacher, but very different responses. And that really gets to the point of today's concluding message that Jesus demands a response. He's not interested in neutrality, and you really can't hold a neutral position on Jesus. Jesus demands a response. You will either embrace him or reject him. You will either embrace what he's saying and do it, or you will reject what he's saying, and you will not do what he has said to do. Here's the idea for today. The response that Jesus is looking for in us is awe 
and devotion. Awe and devotion. And I'm going to unpack this in three ways. First, I'm going to try and show that Jesus Christ's authority astonishes people. It astonishes people into awe that leads them to worship. I'm also going to try and show that Jesus Christ's authority compels people. Not only astonishes them, but it compels them, it moves them into devotion that leads to obedience. So Jesus' authority astonishes people and it compels people. It moves people towards worship and it moves people towards obedience. But, and here's the last point, but the unmistakable object of their awe and devotion is Him. He moves people to worship Him. He moves people, He inspires people to obey Him. Worship and obedience. That is discipleship. That is what it means to follow Jesus. So Jesus' authority astonishes people, astonishes them into awe that leads them to worship him. When you look at what Matthew says in chapter 7, verse 28, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. So G uh, Matthew is noting that the reason for their amazement is not, in this case, miracles. The reason they're amazed is his words. It's his words that astonishes them. He was, uh, the words were coming from somebody who appeared to be just a commoner. From out of the way, Nazareth in the hills. A blue-collar carpenter, an artisan, uh, who didn't train under some famous learned rabbi. Uh, who, who was not from a priestly family. There was no earthly reason for why Jesus taught the way he did. And Luke's gospel records that this was apparent to people as early as 12 years old. As early as, as, as his childhood, people could see that there was obviously something different about Jesus, although he was a commoner. This is what amazed him. These words coming out of the mouth of someone who wasn't part of the religious establishment, hadn't been to seminary, was improperly trained. They were amazed at his words. But what was it about what he was saying that amazed the crowds? Matthew goes on to say in verse 29, he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So, so the scribes or the teachers of the law, they were experts. They were law experts in the law of Moses, the Torah. And they were academically trained in interpreting the law of Moses, right? But, but what they would do is the scribes would teach what the Torah meant by quoting respected rabbis. They would teach the Torah by telling you what others said about the Torah. Uh, so they would speak about what people had said. They were experts in what other people had said about the law of God. That's how they taught it. You know, and then they would argue with one another based on which rabbi or what school of thought uh, they followed. Um, Jesus wasn't doing that. When Jesus stood on the mountain and taught, they heard him speaking as the author of God's law. Gee, he wasn't quoting anybody. He would say things like, I say to you. you, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. None of the scribes, none of the leaders, none of the priests had ever talked that way. But I say to you, that never happened. And so Dietrich Bonhoeffer comments on it by saying this, what had happened? The Son of God had spoken. And his authority was obvious and undeniable to the crowds. Jesus' authority was really unique in Jewish history and in all of human history to this day. I want to talk about the difference between derived authority and inherent authority. Everyone else on the planet has derived authority. Any leader you can think of, any, any authority that you can think of, it is derived from somebody else or from somewhere else. Maybe somebody has authority because of their status. Maybe they were born into an aristocratic or a royal family. 
Maybe somebody has authority because of their office. They've been elected to or appointed to an office, and that office commands authority. Maybe somebody has authority because of their credentials. Maybe they've earned a certificate, or they've earned a license, or they've earned a doctorate. Uh, something about what they have studied and the skills that they have acquired gives them authority to act or operate or speak in a certain way. And so people respect their earned authority by way of their credentials. Or maybe somebody has authority because of their experience. They've lived through something. They've suffered something. They've seen something. And so people respect their authority on a particular issue. But in all of these cases, all of the authority is derived from somewhere or from someone else. And the Apostle Paul sheds light on this in Romans chapter 13, verse 1. He said there that there is no authority except from God. This is ultimately where it all comes from, he said. And those that exist have been instituted by God. So all human authority is derived. It's derived from somewhere or from someone, ultimately from God. But Jesus had, I'm going to say, Jesus had inherent authority. He's not deriving it from any other human person or institution. Jesus had inherent authority. It was, it was in his nature, his essence, right? He's not saying to people from the mountainside, thus saith the Lord, like Moses and Elijah and Isaiah had to do. No, he's saying, I say to you. That is amazing. We saw in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we're told that, that just like Moses, the lawgiver who went up on Mount Sinai and then came down with two tablets written by the finger of God, that Jesus goes up the mountain and he sits down, Matthew says, and he opens his mouth. There are no tablets. It's just Jesus speaking, saying things like, I say to you. We see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Jesus said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is wise. Or in Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, Jesus acting like a judge, right? He says, if you don't obey these words of mine, if you don't obey the will of my Father who is in heaven, he says, I will declare to them Depart from me. I never knew you. Jesus declared himself in the Sermon on the Mount to be the lawgiver and the judge. No one talks like this. Every time a person in history talked like that, the people around them started drinking Kool-Aid and committing suicide. A total disaster every time. But not with Jesus. The people around Jesus... The people who followed him down from the mountain, and who there were crowds, and not every people fell away, but the people who kept following Jesus, the people who were around him, the men and the women, they started a movement that changed the world in the course of history. And sure enough, at the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, the risen Jesus appears to his followers, and he says to them, All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Um, but in that passage, he said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, uh, Matthew said, when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. When they saw the risen Jesus, his true followers worshiped him. Jesus invites people of every race, of every tribe, of every language, in every period of history, to be amazed by him. Jesus wants us to be amazed by him. Jesus wants us to rejoice that we, when we look at him and when we hear his words, we say, such a person does exist. He fulfills all of our hopes for what humanity should be. He wants us to be proud of him. He wants us to look up to him. He wants us to say, wow, finally, finally there's somebody that we can be proud of. There is somebody that can inspire us. There is somebody that we can put all our hope in. And it's him and, and he invites it. It's okay to worship him. 
It's not okay to worship anybody else, but he wants us to be in awe of him. And so we praise him. We praise the name of Jesus. Jesus' authority leads his true followers to worship him in awe. Now, now here's where this worship is coming from. Um, it's not simply that we're in awe of him, but we're devoted to him. He's not just looking for awe, because you can be amazed by somebody and absolutely hate them. Right? The demons were in awe of Jesus, and they hated him. Um, it's not simply awe, it's, it's devotion. We're devoted to Jesus. Jesus' authority compels people in devotion towards obedience. His authority commands not only that we worship him, but that we obey him. Uh, you look at the very, and this is how we're going to conclude our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 8, verse 1. Matthew tells us, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. The Sermon on the Mount shows us that Jesus' authority demands far more than simple intellectual agreement. We're not just believing in what he said, we're doing what he said. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, with all other teachers that the world has ever known, the important thing is the teaching but here is a case in which the teacher is more important even than what he taught. The crowds followed him. You see, the blessed life, the life that is truly flourishing, is about Jesus. Plain and simple, at the end of the day, the Sermon on the Mount is, you want to be blessed, you've got to be about Jesus. It's not just believing what he said, it's, it's believing him. It's following him. Okay, you cannot flourish without Jesus. It's not just about his teaching, it's about the man, it's about the person. The same Jesus who said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them is wise. He also said to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we see from Jesus that it's not duty it's not a sense of obligation, and it's certainly not because of fear that we obey him. Jesus shows us that love, love is the only pure motivation to obey somebody. If it's anything else, it's motivated by self-interest. Only love is the pure motivation to obey a person. So I'm encouraging you at the end of the Sermon on the Mount to examine Jesus' words and actions. Look at the Sermon on the Mount again. Read about the life of Jesus, Jesus in all four Gospels in the New Testament. Examine his words, examine his actions, and determine what is your response to him. You've heard him. Maybe you think you're following him, like the crowd. But do you love him? Do you love Jesus? That's the mark of discipleship. Ask yourself, who astonishes you? Who are you in awe of in this world? And who are you obeying? Who gets you up in the morning? Who motivates you? Who compels you to act, to live, to plan, to study, to work, to suffer? Who astonishes you and who compels you? Who are you in awe of? Who leads you into action? And do you even know? Have you ever thought of that? Do you know who is inspiring you? Do you know who's causing you to do what you do? Jesus's unique authority, his worthiness to be adored and to be followed should be obvious to you. Jesus' authority and worthiness to be adored and to be followed should be obvious to everybody, but it's not. And here's why it's not. The Apostle Paul explains it in Romans chapter 1. And in verse, 13, uh, verse 18 of Romans chapter 1, Paul writes, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness 
of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is why what should be obvious is not obvious to us because as Paul said, we suppress the truth about God in our unrighteousness. And the word there for unrighteousness in the original Greek language of the book of Romans, the word unrighteousness, it meant it was a state of being and a state of doing. Unrighteousness is, is just who we are. It's, it's how we think. It's how we look at ourselves and each other and the world. And unrighteousness is also what we do. It's how we act. It's the decisions we make and the habits we perpetuate in our lives. So that unrighteousness, it has a dual effect. Unrighteousness in you suppresses what's obvious about Jesus in you. It, su it suppresses Jesus' obvious authority to you. But then as you live and act, your actions suppress the truth about Jesus in other people. So our unrighteousness, it suppresses the truth about Jesus in us and around us. So that in time, you don't see what's obvious about Jesus. And then because of you, the people around you don't see what's obvious about Jesus. And just think about it. Look at the world in which we're living right now. What are we reading? What are we watching? What are we listening to? Everybody's claiming some type of authority. Everyone's claiming to have studied enough. Everyone's claiming, claiming to have experienced enough. Everyone's claiming to have suffered enough. Everybody is claiming their own authority. Therefore, we should all listen to them. And really what that is is another form of unrighteousness, but it's called self-righteousness. Everyone's claiming their own authority. Everybody wants you to watch them and listen to them. Nobody's talking about Jesus. And Paul says it's because we suppress the truth in our unrighteousness. Now look, here is the difference. According to the Sermon on the Mount, here is the difference between those who are blessed and those who are not. Let me be more direct. Here is the difference, according to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, between those who are blessed and those who are cursed. The difference is whether you can read the Sermon on the Mount and be driven in your heart in desperation to Jesus. Can you, by reading the Sermon on the Mount, be driven in desperation to Jesus for help? Remember, Jesus has been talking about righteousness, which is really the, the, the theme of the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom of God and its greater righteousness. And we talked about how, how uh, John Stott summarized what righteousness means in the Bible. And he gave us three senses of righteousness. He said, first of all, righteousness is living right before God. But righteousness is all Righteousness is also doing right before others, doing right to others. But ultimately, uh, how can you live right before God and do right by others? You've got to be right. You've got to be right. You've got to be in a right relationship with God. It's not just living rightly and doing rightly. It's being right with your Creator. That is righteousness from the Bible's perspective. And look, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and if you admit to yourself, I don't have that kind of righteousness. I don't have that greater righteousness. It's not in me. It is beyond me. I cannot attain to it. And if you hunger and thirst for Jesus, who owns that righteousness and can give it to you, then friend, you are blessed. So let the object of your awe and your devotion be Jesus. You can admire people. You can respect people. You can follow orders and obey your parents and obey the law. Uh, but let the object of your awe and your devotion be Jesus above all people and above all things.
We know that what compels us towards following someone is love. They inspire us. They capture our they, they capture our imagination. They move us toward devotion. We want to follow them. We'll give up anything for them. We'll follow them anywhere. We'll do anything for them. We know that what compels us towards obedience is love. And listen to what the Apostle Paul said about Jesus in Philippians chapter 2. He said, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You see, the Apostle Paul teaches us an amazing thing. Jesus's inherent authority gave him every right, every right to command our worship and our love. Nobody else has the right to command your worship and your love, but Jesus had it. Jesus had every right. He inherently had the authority to demand such things from you. But we didn't give him our love. We didn't worship him and love him as God. We rejected him and crucified him. But the reason, the reason that unrighteous, forgiven sinners worship Jesus and love Jesus is because, Paul says, he gave up his authority. This is why the universe worships Jesus and will worship. Someday every knee will bow and every tongue will admit that he's Lord, <laughs> whether they love him or not. Eventually, we'll all have to come around to the truth about Jesus. Um, but Paul says the universe will worship Jesus because he gave up his authority. The only one who ever had true, real authority surrendered it because of love. That's why we love Jesus. That's why we worship him. Because out of love, he gave up his right to be worshipped and obeyed. And because of his loving sacrifice, he is worshipped and obeyed all the more. And so the Apostle John wrote, We love because he first loved us. And so the response that Jesus is looking for in you, in me, is awe and devotion. That's discipleship. Worship and obedience. Do you know him? Are you really following him? So examine for yourself Jesus' words and actions and determine what is your response to him. Look, you don't need to mute every voice in your life. You, you don't need to mute most influences in your life. But you need to be wise. Jesus has warned us three times. You need to be wise. You need to test and examine whatever is astonishing you and whoever is compelling you. You need to test and examine them and, and what it is you need to test and examine it in the light of Jesus' authority. And this, is, this type of testing and examination is only possible in spiritually deaf sinners like me and you by the grace of God. It's the only way. That's the only way we're going to test and examine rightly by the grace of God. And you know what? It is fully possible for those who receive the grace of God. So, the Sermon on the Mount. You and I are called to live it. Not just to, not just to read it, 
and think about it, but to live it. But we know we cannot. That's how we truly know we've been impacted rightly by the Sermon on the Mount. We know we must live it, but we know that we cannot. We need a greater righteousness. We need a righteousness that exceeds all the rest. We need Jesus because that righteousness is bound up in him. We need him. So may you be filled with all awe for Jesus. And may you be moved in devotion to follow him. Worship, obedience, those are the marks of discipleship. And may you be found to have this greater righteousness that Jesus offers to anyone who will trust him and follow him. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, I ask that um, if I have been a scribe in any way today, if I have been scribe-like in my words uh, or in my presentation, I pray that people would see past uh, the human aspects of what I have said and, and that they would, despite my weakness, see Jesus, that they would hear him and be in awe of him and be moved to obey him. I ask that you would fill us with an awe of Jesus and a devotion to Jesus. Uh, that, that proves us to be his true disciples. Help us to live according to the Sermon on the Mount. Help us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and not be worried about the other things, but to trust him and to follow him. We praise you for Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we ask for the faith to follow you. Amen. Receive today's benediction. Receive today's blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied.